You know, the spring of 2007 was one of the most memorable Easter's I've ever had. Earlier that year, maybe even the year before, I'd had a mentor come up to me and say, hey, I've got a group of guys that I'm meeting with and I'm pouring into somewhere around 11 or 12. And he said, I, I want to invest some intentional time in your life and in the life of these guys that I'm meeting with. Would you be interested and would you be willing to come once a week, nine o'clock Tuesday nights to just talk about life and talk about how to be uh, you know, a great husband and how to be uh, great in the marketplace and, and things like that. And uh, I, I said, yeah, absolutely. I admired um, this this uh, friend of mine and, and wanted to have many parts of my life emulate what he has as far as his career and his, his relationship with the Lord and his relationship with his kids and his wife. So I started meeting with him that, that fall, previous fall. And um, it was incredible. It, all of the, none of the times were overly structured, but they were all impactful. But nothing was as impactful as that night in April of 2007. You see that night, he told us to come and meet him and uh, to meet him in his office. And to, whenever we arrived, he said, you know, don't say a word. I've got something really serious I want to discuss with you guys tonight. So we went in and we were all in silence there. And there was a lot of anticipation in the room. All he did was get up and he said, follow me. And so uh, we followed him. And we left, we left his office. And of course we were in college. So we were on a college campus and had a number of different buildings. And what he did that night, I've never forgot. We walked out of his office and into the cool of the spring air. And I remember just the feeling of the atmosphere outside and on campus that night. It was completely dark by this point. There wasn't a lot of activity around where we were, so it was really silent. You could really, you could just hear kind of a gentle breeze blowing and you could feel kind of the crispness of the spring on your skin. We went to a building. We went uh, up to the, the top floor of this building and on the top floor, there was a conference room. And he said, gentlemen, come in. And this is what he told us. The soldiers came and broke the flags of the first that was crucified with him and of the other. But when they came to Jesus and seeing that he was dead already, they did not break his legs. But a soldier with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he who bears record and saw it knows that his record is true. And he knows that he says the truth so that you may believe. It was Thursday night in an upper room. Jesus had just had his last meal on this earth with his closest followers, the disciples. He had just instituted a new covenant with bread and with wine, wine symbolizing his blood and the bread symbolizing his body, his life that was given for us. About midnight, they all left that upper room. They walked over the cobblestone streets in Jerusalem, out the city gate, across the brook Kedron, this was Passover season, and thousands of animals were being slaughtered. I've often wondered if Jesus and his disciples did not stop when they came to the Brook Kedron. And if they did, he must have looked down to see the blood-tinged water. 
What was he thinking at that moment? He knew at that time that from then on there would be no need for a blood sacrifice. For in a matter of hours, his blood was going to be shed for the sins of the world, yours and mine. They walked out the city gates across the Brook Kedron out into the Mount of Olives and up into the Garden of Gethsemane. And it was there that the agony that Jesus went through became so apparent. I've often wondered what his disciples thought when he said his soul was sorrowful even to death. He asked three of his disciples to go a little bit further with him into the garden and to stay awake and to pray because the end was near. He went on further into the garden. The scripture says in agony he prayed. Luke records how much agony he was in. He said, sweat as it were great drops of blood fell to the ground from his head. Now, this agony that he went through, I I believe that Jesus went through agony in the garden just as he went through agony on the cross. He, He was wrestling with this decision. He goes back to his disciples. They've fallen asleep. He says, couldn't you have stayed awake just for one hour? He went back into the garden and he prayed. And in agony, he said to the Father, let this cup pass from me. He was saying, Father, I know all things are possible through you. You can redeem man some other way. Take this cup from me. But you know how he finished that prayer. Not my will, but your will be done. And it was God the Father's will that Jesus die on the cross. So as he agonized in the garden, the man Jesus, who is made of flesh and blood, suffered. And as Luke records, he sweat blood. Now, this is called hematidrosis in the medical literature. I've not seen it. I've had a friend who is a nurse in an ER and a long time ago, she told me that she saw it. It's when, it's when a person goes through such trauma that there are these capillaries, blood vessels all over the body that when they go through such stress that those blood vessels begin to dilate. And the trauma is so great that they rupture into those sweat glands. Usually the principle is fainting. Jesus stayed and he stayed and he stayed and he fought that agony. You see, the first shedding of blood for my remission of sin and your forgiveness of sin was not by someone laying a hand on the man Jesus. In that garden, he agonized over our sin. He agonized over going to the cross. What was he afraid of? Was he afraid? I mean, he was in agony. What was going through his mind? Could it be that he was saying, I I know about sin. I don't know sin. He's never sinned. Could it be that he was saying, I, Father, I know I can handle the sin, but can I be separated from you? You see, Jesus had been with the Father from the beginning as the Word of God, the Gospel of John tells us. He's never been separated from the Father, but in a matter of hours, he agonized and he prayed and he sweat blood. 
for you and me. Soon there's a ruckus and up the hill with torches come, come the Jews, those who had paid off Judas to betray Jesus. They come and they find him and they take him and they bind his hands. There's a scuffle that takes place between Peter and one of the guards, Malchus. Peter becomes physical and he takes a sword and he, he cuts off Malchus's ear and Jesus stops it and stops Peter and he takes the ear that's fallen to the ground puts it back on Malchus in place and reprimands Peter. This is not what we're about. So if this is about three o'clock in the morning, they take Jesus down the hill and they take him to, um, to Caiaphas, the high priest. And they have this illegal trial at three o'clock in the morning and they question him back and forth and back and forth and Caiaphas asked what have you been teaching these people Jesus said I've I've spoken openly in the temple ask them I've not spoken in secret it was at that point that one of the guards went up and they he slapped Jesus on the face and they said why do you answer the high priest in such a way and the physical beating begins. They take him across town to Annas. This is three or four o'clock in the morning. They continue to question him back and forth. What are you doing? Who do you say that you are? Their objective is to kill him. But you see, the Jews, under Jewish law, there's two things they cannot do. They, they cannot hold a trial at night and they cannot pronounce the death sentence. Here's the second trial at night and again he goes before Caiaphas and, and Caiaphas, about to give up, yells at Jesus and says, are you the son of God? And Jesus responded, I am. And Caiaphas became so upset, the scripture says he ripped his clothes. This was blasphemy. But now the physical beating could begin. The scripture said they bound him. They blindfolded him. They spit upon him. But Jesus didn't complain. Since earlier the night before, he's not had any food. He's, he's lost blood in the garden. He's weak, he's tired, and they're beating him and they're mocking him. I imagine one of the things that probably hurt the most was the mocking, because you know what they said, you're the son of this or you're the son of that. At that moment, probably only two people really knew who knew he had a father, and that was he and Mary. They beat him, they mocked him, they spit upon him. But Jesus didn't complain. He didn't protest. So now, the scripture says it was early the next morning because they couldn't get, they couldn't uh, get the death penalty. So they'd already had this these illegal trials, the scripture says about five, I guess it was probably 5.45 in the morning, it was early, the scripture says. They had their legal trial. It didn't take them long to pronounce he's guilty of blasphemy. But how are they going to get Jesus killed? The scripture says they take him to Pilate, the Roman governor. They didn't go into the governor's palace because it was Passover season and they wouldn't be defiled, so... They called for Pilate to come out. Pilate came out and he heard their case and he questioned them. And then he heard that Jesus was a Galilean, which is Herod's 
jurisdiction. Herod was in town, so he dismissed him and sent him over to Herod. They took him over to Herod, and Jesus never said a word the whole time. They stripped him, they beat him. Herod wanted to see a miracle. They mocked him. They put the robe back on him. They took him back over to Pilate. The scripture says Pilate took Jesus inside. And he questioned him. Are you the king of the Jews? Pilate didn't want to have anything to do with him. So, Pilate had an idea. I'll have him scourged. You don't, you don't scourge someone and then have them crucified. You don't sentence someone to 20 years in jail and then have them executed. Pilate thought he had a way out here. And so Pilate had him scourged. There was two kinds of scourging. There was the Jewish scourging with so many prescribed licks over the shoulder. And then there was Roman scourging. He was called near death. It was done by a, an officer, a Roman officer, called a lictor. He had this tool of torture called a flagellum four pieces of leather, six feet long, each one having a piece of bone or a piece of link of chain or a piece of glass at the end. He held it with a wooden handle and they took the victim and they stripped them naked, put them on a post four feet tall out in front of the Senate building. And there they beat their victim. Every time the flagellum, the pieces of leather would hit the flesh. It would cause some pain, but whenever the link of chain or the piece of glass or the piece of bone would break the skin and pull back, it would hit a blood vessel. With every blood vessel, there's a, a nerve ending. I guess it's probably like multiple bee stings. A man couldn't handle this for very long, maybe two and a half minutes, and then could lose consciousness. The lictor would stop. He would go up and he would feel a pulse. He'd check respiration. And if he could still count the pulse, he would continue the beating. And then after he could check on him and the pulse was so thin that he couldn't count it, they'd take him off the pole. They'd stand him up. They put the robe back on him. They put a crown of thorns on his head to mock him. And then brought him back to Pilate. Pilate thought he had a way out. It was a tradition that you could turn loose one of the prisoners. But the scribes and the Pharisees had convinced the people to yell, crucify him when it came to Jesus. And finally, Pilate said, I wash my hands of this. And they took him to be crucified. The Romans had crucifixion down to a science. They were experts at it. They got it from the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians used to boil people in oil. And if you boil someone in oil, they, they live for like three seconds and that wasn't long enough to deter the crime, so they started hanging people in trees. You hang someone in a tree, they live 12 to 14 days, but they didn't have enough soldiers to station the victims on the trees, and so they started placing them on a platform and nailing them to the tree. And the Romans had this down to such a science that they could tell you how long a person would live on a cross by the way they nailed their hands and feet and bent their legs on the cross. If you know your history, you know that after the defeat of Spartacus, for 19 miles out of Rome, on the road, one crucifixion after another, 
They were sending a message. This is what happens to anyone who pushes back against Rome. So when they took Jesus, three of the gospel writers say that Simon of Cyrene carried his cross. John said he started out with it. But you know, when, as soon as they put that cross piece, six feet long, six by six, on his shoulder, tied to it, he hasn't had any food since the night before. He's experienced nothing but mocking and ridicule, and he's been beaten, and he's lost so much blood. Obviously, he's going to fall, and he fell. And then Simon of Cyrene takes his cross piece, and they head for Golgotha. When they got to Golgotha at the top of the hill, they laid Jesus down on the cross. Um, this is painful. This is where they took the cross piece, and Jesus felt this because they took the cross piece and they don't lift the cross piece, they lift, they drag the man who's tied to the cross piece and they pull him up on the post. Before they did that, they nailed him. A soldier took a five flange nail and with a knee on the shoulder and a knee on the elbow and with one blow right through his hand. Now, a lot of people have, have discussed this and scholars have argued about this, but if we study the Greek, the anatomy of the hand includes the wrist. And if you'll just feel that, those bones in your wrist, that's where that five-flange nail was placed. You see, they knew how to nail a person to the cross because if that victim became hysterical and pulled himself off, then that soldier could go to jail. And so they nailed him to the cross and they knew how to do it so he would stay and then they lifted him up and then a miraculous thing took hap happened. They crossed one foot over the other, right where you tie your shoelace. That's where the molecular bone is. And they drew that, placed that nail there. And with one blow of a sledgehammer, they pounded it through his feet and not a bone was broken. No bones were broken in the body of Jesus. But he experienced more pain because on those bones, there's lining and there's a stripping of that lining. The pain was excruciating. Jesus didn't make a lot of speeches when he was on the cross. He couldn't. You see, the way someone would live on a cross was they would, they would pull up on their, their wrist to inhale and they would slump to exhale. And pull up to inhale and slump to exhale. So in order to inhale, to say any words, Jesus would have to hold himself up with his pectoral muscles, and those muscles were going to give out in about 30 minutes. So he didn't make a lot of speeches. He said to the ladies coming up to the cross, don't cry for me. Cry for yourselves. He said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. For three hours he was on the cross and it was light and for the next three hours it was dark. Scripture says that Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is what he, this is what he was troubled by so much in the garden. Because when it became all dark, the sins of the world were upon him, yours and mine. And Jesus cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
You know, we read in the Bible, and we've learned that verse John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he loved this world so much that he gave his only son. That little word, so, is really the biggest word in the Bible. Because God loved you and loved me so much that he allowed his son to die on the cross. He had the power to take him off that cross. He had the power to defeat everyone that opposed Jesus at that moment. But it was God the Father's will to rescue you and me through the shed blood of his son to pay the price for our sins. For three hours it was light For three hours it was dark. This was not an eclipse. The scripture says it was dark all over the world. You see, when God turned his back on his son, Jesus, he didn't look at him when your sin and my sin was on him, but he didn't let anyone else look at him either. The sins of the world, one sin, one man's sin would have been enough whole world was on his shoulders. And he who bears record knows that it's true. It is true. The soldiers came and broke the legs of the first that was crucified with him and then the second. You see, you break the legs of those who are being crucified, they can no longer stand to inhale. They'll die in 30 minutes of suffocation. Soldiers came and broke the legs of the first that was crucified with him and then with the other. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But a soldier with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he who saw it bears record. And his record is true. And he knows that he says truth. So that you may believe. Thou hast
Salvation's road with fear and trembling. Your way born as my own, as Christ is formed in me. as the world does, as followers of Jesus. We don't grieve as if we have no hope. We don't even grieve the same as the disciples did when they saw Jesus crucified. For we know of the resurrection. We live a life in remembrance of what the Lord has done. We sing these songs and we proclaim this truth 
that our hope is found in Jesus. He is the God of all comforts. Let's sing together. Let's worship in song together and lift our hearts and our voices in our homes. May God be glorified. the bird. 